back in Mark 8. Never thought we'd make it to chapter 8, did you? I feel pretty good because Pastor Hartman and uh, Kemmer are still in John, and he started about the same time I did in Mark, so we're uh, keeping pace. But it's good to consider carefully these different passages, which we may be familiar with, and uh, get a lot of the details and the point of them. Let's begin our time in prayer. Father, we come, or we do serve you, our risen Savior. Help us to keep that in mind. Lord, we know you live. Lord, we see that as the, con the confirmation of our confidence, of our hope. Lord, even in this passage where you promise it and show it as a sign, Lord, help us to see with eyes of faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you, what makes Christianity, true Christianity, specifically Jesus Christ, distinct from any other religion, I'm sure I would get varied answers. We've had many different religious people start even their own groups throughout the ages. In the Middle East, in our prisons, in multiple uh, places, the followers of a man named Muhammad are abounding. In our area, there's a man that started his own group, Joseph Smith. In Upper State, New York, which had quite a few different groups start out of it, there is a group started by a woman who are now defunct because they didn't believe in uh, marriage. And there have been many different men to come and proclaim themselves to be the herald of truth and of God. Jesus' own testimony about himself uh, and that which is confirmed and repeated in the book of Hebrews is that he is the Son of God. He is the Christ. And maybe your answer was uh, theolog theologically sound that, well, Jesus is God. Well, if that's your answer, then I've at least communicated something to you. And yes, you're right. But how do we know he is God? Well, he says it, scripture says it, but then he proves it by rising again the third day. If you go to any of these other men's graves, they are still there. In fact, if you're a good Muslim, you go and walk around the grave of Muhammad. But we, as we just sang, serve a risen Savior. And this is important and central to our understanding to who Jesus is. He's the only person who has the power over death is God. If he is not who he says he is, then as Paul writes, we are the most miserable of people because we're trusting in something in vain. Jesus is going to deal with this very concept, this very idea in these short verses. Let's read the passage as we begin. It says here in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 11, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. Isn't that a great way to start a conversation? Seeking from him, from Jesus, a sign. Wait a minute, didn't he just feed 4,000 people? Do you need another sign than that? He's just healed many. He's walked on water. 
He's healed, even brought back from death. A little girl. And yet here come the religious elite arguing with Jesus and demanding a sign from heaven to test him. I think we see here Jesus' humanity, fully God, fully man, showing through a little bit, and he sighed. Not just a little sigh. What does it say? He sighed deeply. This is one of those aggravated sighs. Sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Mark is the most brief of this encounter. We'll be looking in Matthew, which expands our understanding of what is said and done. But did you notice, here come the religious leaders. He's been doing signs all along. Bread, feeding the crowds as God fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. Raising a little girl, walking on the water, healing diseases, casting out demons. I mean, he's just literally busy doing these signs as he's teaching. So much so that occasionally he has to try and get away. and Even then, the crowds follow him. We've already read and seen where Jesus has told the disciples, let's go away to a deserted place and rest. In fact, at the end of a very long day, we saw back in chapter 4, Jesus is tired. He's put up with the Pharisees. He's put up with his own mother and brothers coming and trying to take him away. as crazy. He's done signs and miracles, and he's asleep on the boat in the middle of a storm. And the disciples now bug him and say, we ha are going to drown. And Jesus' response is, where's your faith? He's been try he gets, tries to get rest when he can, but he's been just busy in compassion and love, dealing with the problems of the people and teaching them the truth of God. And so astounding is it that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds are amazed because here is one who teaches with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. And these very scribes and Pharisees, these ones who are the religious leaders who will only really quote other authorities and hardly even reference the Old Testament, come and are arguing with Jesus, the one they should be sitting at his feet and learning from. And they test him because they have no faith arguing they test him and the idea here isn't just okay prove that you're messiah but as is their attitude over and over again testing him trying to trip him up that's why some will come later a lawyer in fact and ask uh, which is the greatest commandment right because if jesus likes this one we'll say that's not the greatest commandment it's the other one Or another time when they come bringing a woman caught in adultery, likely one of them was the other half of the adulterous pair. Jesus' simple response is, the one without sin cast the first stone. These come, and it's wearisome, He's been showing who he is over and over again. No sign will be given this generation. In fact, then he left them, got into a boat again, and went to the other side. Jesus is dealing with them in silence. 
Matthew records for us a fuller, a fuller picture here. It says in chapter 16, And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test him. This is the same incident. And asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, It will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. The implication being, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. You know how to tell the weather, right? You ever seen one of these weather gauges, real fancy? It's a rock with a string around it attached to a wood stick. If the rock is bouncing, it's an earthquake. If it's twirling around, it's a tornado. If there, if it's wet, it's raining. If there's snow on the rock, it's snowing. You know, it's very simple, right? So simple that even our weathermen have a hard time doing it right. When we look up and we see clouds and go, oh, maybe there's rain, and it just kind of passes over. And We're reminded of the other passage that talks about waterless clouds. But Jesus is making a point here. You, you scribes and Pharisees who are supposed to be the religious leaders, the ones who are trained in the Scripture, who should know what's happening most of all, You can look out and see the weather and have a pretty good idea what's going to happen, but you still don't have the eyes of faith to see what's happening now in front of you. Jesus says the only sign you're going to get, no sign is going to be given. I'm not going to just do a a poof miracle right here. I'm not a genie in a bottle. The only sign you get is the sign of Jonah. Well, what happened to Jonah? Oh, he was in the fish, right? Three days, three nights. Long enough for him to change his attitude, repent, and also long enough to prefigure the Christ. Jesus says that's the only sign you're going to get. In fact, he's going to reiterate it later on, the last week as he's walking past the temple. Tear this temple down, and in three days, I will rebuild it. In fact, in that passage, it doesn't seem as if the Pharisees have gotten it, but they have because they go to Pilate after they've had Jesus killed and say, he said he would rise again, you better post a guard. Like that's going to stop him. Here is the sign. What Jesus is trying to communicate here is prefiguring, pre-telling his resurrection. You could say it this way. Everything leading up to this point and later on is trying to attest to Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. Everything he's done screams this. In fact, Jesus says that these people who are worshiping ignorantly as I come in the gate weren't crying out Hosanna, the rocks would do it. Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. If Jesus says it's going to happen As he does here in this sign of Jonah, you could take that to the bank. That is a sure thing. And his works, what he's been doing, attest to it. Notice here in Mark, even as it will say in Matthew The Pharisees came to argue 
and to seek a sign to test him. This is not a, a seeking a sign like uh, in the Old Testament. Gideon, God, if this is what you want me to do, then put dew on the fleece and not on the ground, and put dew on the ground and not on the fleece. No, that was asking a sign in belief. I know you're God, I know you're in control, but I'm not sure I'm understanding you correctly, God. Can you be a little more specific? This is, yeah, we don't think you're God. Go ahead and prove it. Yeah, just do one more sign, then we'll believe. They're saying that even too, the nails are in his hand and hangs on the tree. If you're really the Christ, come down, then we'll believe you. When they should be the ones that know most of all that he must die for the sins of mankind. In fact, it's even the chief priest, not knowing what he was saying, prophesied and said, it is expedient, basically, that one should die for the nation. They have no belief. They're religious, but they have no faith. They come to argue, to test. Matthew says it this way, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him. to put him to the test. Show us a sign from heaven. I'm surprised Jesus did not re reference to an Old Testament prophet, Elijah on the mount. You didn't believe Elijah, and fire came down from heaven. How would you believe if I did it? They came to test in unbelief. And the great thing is, even if people do not believe, even if they uh, seek to destroy Jesus by any means necessary, if they seek to wipe out the word of God and fail and fail and fail again, no matter what, his works attest to it, but he is the risen Lord despite human unbelief in the face of overwhelming evidence. We are but a mere eight chapters into just this book with pulling in the, the coinciding passages from the other Gospels. And I dare say it would be hard for us to keep track of how many different times Jesus has proven he is God come in the flesh. Because it happens over and over and over and over again. And yet, they wish it away. If they don't believe in him, then, then he must not be the Messiah. But he's the risen Lord, whether they believe or not. Whether they're an eminent scientist, a great religious spokesman, Jesus is still the risen Lord, even if they don't believe. And they don't believe with a mountain of evidence. Is there any wonder we've not found the bones of Jesus? We found many other people. He's not there, for he is risen just as he said. Being risen proves him to be Lord God Almighty. He is the risen. Lord, attested by his works, even though there is unbelief. Notice his response. 
It's trying to him. Can would, would, you still don't believe after all I've done? And you can almost hear some of the exasperation even with the disciples towards the end. Do you still not understand? Do you still not believe? You can only imagine God's exasperation with us. It's a good thing he has infinite patience when even we who have faith fail to act like it. He's exasperated. Why does this generation seek a sign? Matthew records for us, as we'll see in a second, this is an evil generation for asking for one. Truly, I will give no sign to this generation. Previous ones had Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these men with books named after them at the end of our Old Testament who are beacons of God working, who showed the mighty hand of God. The sad thing is the people hadn't changed. Oh, they got rid of their idolatry problem on the outside. They just replaced it with Jehovah and the rules that we're going to put around God. No sign. Why? Because they did not believe. Jesus asked them, answering, really, when it's evening, you say it's going to be fair weather. Right? Red light at night, sailor's delight. Red light morn, sailor be warned. You know how to read the weather. I mean, there's literally a lame man walking by. There's blind people that you know have been blind for ages, and now they see. And you don't know what time it is. You don't know who I am. We've seen it. Isaiah has foretold it. The blame. Uh, the lame will walk. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. And the mute will speak. In the morning, there will be a stormy day. Why? The sky's red. Oh, we can see the signs. Haven't you been seeing the signs? It's obvious. That's why Paul, when writing the Romans, says people are without excuse. The works of God are evident. His holiness, his mighty power, everything he is is displayed in creation, and even more specifically, the writer of Hebrews says, in his Son who came. Jesus Christ. It's only those who don't want to look who are asking now for a sign. Because it is overwhelmingly obvious. For this reason, Jesus says, you know how to interpret the weather, and because of this, you're an evil and adulterous generation whose heart is away from God, who wants to test God. Like Ahaz, king, Oh, I won't ask God for a sign. I'm too religious for that, too pietous. Here's the sign. Messiah is coming. And your kingdom's going to be wiped out with the rest of them before he does. No sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. That is, the Messiah will be in the earth for three days. He is the risen Lord. In spite or despite human unbelief, he is the risen Lord as made obvious by the works he has already performed. You can see the clouds on the horizon, but you don't see the lame walking. You can see the rain coming. 
It's obvious, but you can't see the blind who now see and are walking around. And even when he raises from the dead, these same people will begin the rumor that he was stolen by his disciples. This lie of lies. Jesus Christ, everything he's done, screams and rejoices and and proclaims that he is God. It's obvious, yet there's unbelief. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Does he really have to ask that question? Does he know their hearts already? Is he going to look over at Simon a Pharisee, not Simon Peter, Simon the Pharisee, and say, Simon, I have something to to talk to you about. Who loves the one who forgives a debt more? The one who owes little or the one who owes much? He knows their thoughts. He knows why they're doing this. And yet, he sighs. Truly, I say to you, of truth, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Matthew picks this up and says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Three days, three nights. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him. Matthew chapter 12, another incident. Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. (coughs) Again, you think they would have learned, right? By chapter 16, he's already said this in Matthew 12. And the evil and adulterous generation, they seek for a sign, but no sign will be given it to accept the sign of the prophet Jonah. It's like calling and getting the same answering service over and over again. I got to speak to some people the other day who are supposed to know how to schedule things for VA appointments. And they couldn't even find the provider I was already scheduled with to move me to the next day with the same provider. So then I had to go through a whole whole, whole rigmarole to get to someone else who, who found another provider for the next day, who then they later called me the day before and said, oh yeah, that person can't take any patients that day. And you're thinking, why am I talking to these people? Here's Jesus going through the same thing. Why am I keep doing these things? They won't see. They won't hear. The only sign that they will perceive is when I rise again. Here he gives in chapter 12 of the book of Matthew the reason for this sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man. Jesus' favorite way to reference himself. Be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. And then Jesus goes further. Imagine standing there. You are the holy, righteous, self-righteous, self-holy, religious elite. And here is this uh, wannabe prophet walking around, this teacher. Oh, I'm just trying to see if you meet our standards to be a religious teacher. What sign will you give? Jonah. And not only that, when I come three days, three nights after, just like Jonah was, and I'm risen again, and then I come back, there's kind of an ellipsis here when I come back in judgment. The men of Nineveh. You know Nineveh. You heard of Nineveh? The terrorists of their day. These people Jonah was sent to. Those guys will rise up at the judgment 
with this generation and condemn it for their unbelief. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Ninevites, people who had come and conquer a city and put the men's heads on stakes around the city, who would go in and take the women who were with child and slice them across the abdomen to kill both mother and baby at the same time, would leave no generation to come back and destroy them. We know some of their descendants today. They wear these neato, neato vests that go boom. And those people will get up at the day of judgment and condemn the Pharisees and scribes for their unbelief. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south Queen of Sheba will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. One who had to travel miles and miles and only got to meet Solomon. She came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We've been studying Solomon's wisdom book, Proverbs. If you haven't figured it out, it points to God. The queen of Sheba sought and found and heard the wisdom of Solomon. And this Gentile queen will condemn the religious elite for their unbelief. Why? Because Jesus... He is the risen Lord. His works proclaim it, but it's also signified by His bodily resurrection. His fulfillment of this sign, of the sign of Jonah, being risen three days after His death, proves He is Lord. Jesus Christ it's the risen Lord signified by his bodily resurrection. Some people will say, well, Jesus uh, didn't really die. He just swooned. Yeah, see what, what happened to you if you were crucified after being scourged literally to an inch of your life. See if you would survive. And then have, have a nice hole poked in your side by a spear. See if you would survive. Others would say, well, well, he died, but he came back just as a spirit. Oh, yeah? Talk to Thomas. Would you like to put the hand? Put your fingers right there, Thomas. There, there's a nice hole. It'll fit right through. Put it in my side, Thomas. Of course, we rag on Thomas, but the rest of them were asking the same question, just weren't saying it out loud. Jesus proves himself to be God, the risen Lord, by his resurrection bodily. Teacher, we wish to see a sign. Do you now? You mean the, the, the lame guy that came down on the roof, walked out with his bed, was not enough for you? The blind guy that's now holding a, a job down at uh, the, the Haji Mart is not enough for you? The deaf guy, the mute guy who's now singing in the Levitical choir is not enough for you? Okay, what sign would you have? You evil, adulterous generation. The only sign you get is the sign of Jonah. Did Jesus do other miracles after this? Yes. The point is he, he's pointing them to his resurrection. 
maybe, just maybe, some of them having heard, maybe even one who will see him on a road after his resurrection will then believe. Here's the sign, the prophet Jonah. Jonah went to the fish, right? The first submariner. Throw me overboard. I, I've disobeyed God. At least Jonah had the, uh, the wherewithal to admit it, not get the rest of his shipmates killed in the storm. Just throw me overboard, guys. I can't do it myself. Just throw me overboard and, you know, there's, God will take care of you. Jonah's down there muttering to himself, stupid Ninevites. Why does God want to save the Ninevites? I know if, if I go, he'll, I'll preach, and God will save them. They'll repent. Because I know what God can do. There he is, three days, three nights. I think, hopefully, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just as stubborn as Jonah. After the first day and night of smelling fish uh, stomach and all that entails, I would decide to get out of there and repent. But maybe not. We are stubborn creatures. Of course, God uses that to get Jonah going the right direction. Here's the only sign you're going to get. In fact, I kind of wonder if Jesus kind of looking at the scribes and Pharisees and going, you Jonah's I as God am trying to get your attention. So the Son of Man be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, in the tomb, in the grave. Why? Because Jesus is pointing to his bodily resurrection as proof that he is the risen God. He is the risen Lord. And so we can say with certainty, He is the risen Lord who died and rose again the third day. Why? Because He said it would happen. Of course, if you continue in the book, we know it happens. It's attested to. The disciples record it for us. The women discover it. The whole group proclaims it on the day of Pentecost. Paul defends it logically. And then times are very confidence and hope to it. Notice too, the men of Nineveh, the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, these who the religious elite would consider outside of faith, outside of the possibility of faith, the most unexpected are the ones who will condemn by their faith this generation. The ones who had to look even farther in faith than the people around Jesus will condemn them. Imagine being a Pharisee and on the day of judgment, this Ninevite comes up to you. And then it's like, why? We had that measly Jonah come into town. Just barely saying, repent or God will destroy the city. Repent or God will destroy the city. I really don't want to be here. Right? It's kind of like the little girl on Miracle on 34th Street, right? It's silly, but I believe, right? And we repented. From the king down to the lowliest of the low, we put on sackcloth and ashes. We even put them on our animals. We believe God, and you saw him? Then another one, maybe, 
pompous and self-righteous, wondering why he's standing there at the great white throne judgment. Didn't I believe in God? Didn't I do great things for him? I tried to stamp out those dirty Christians. Here comes the Queen of Sheba. I went and talked to Solomon. He told me about Yahweh. And you saw him? And you still didn't believe? Jesus closes those comments with something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Solomon is here now. Big, flashing, neon, sign, I am God. Because he is the risen Lord who died and rose again the third day. He is the risen Lord who is greater than Jonah and Solomon. You notice, if you read the narrative of Jonah, Jonah still has an attitude problem. He's more worried about a plant than the eternal souls in a city. And he gets mad at God for saving the souls and not the plant. Solomon, with all his problems later on, But no one was glor as gloriously arrayed or as wise, humanly speaking, divinely given as Solomon. And yet, something better than Solomon was walking the earth. And he showed himself to be by his mighty works. And ultimately, in his bodily resurrection. Do you notice when he went after the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew 12? Evil and adulterous generation. Imagine walking up to somebody and they call you an evil and adulterous person. Like, you don't know me. I didn't even speed on the way here. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. There's no sign but the sign of Jonah. Three days, three nights. And something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Solomon is here. Here's what you're supposed to do. Just as these even dirty Gentiles who you would consider un unapproachable to faith, as they repented... That's what you and I must do. That's the only way for these scribes and Pharisees, these Sadducees, to come to Jesus. What we could say is Jesus is commanding repentance. Look how he says that the Queen of the South will come She's going to condemn you. Solomon was great, but I'm greater. Hint, hint. Jesus Christ signified as the risen Lord by his bodily resurrection. Jesus Christ is the risen Lord who commands our repentance. In the same breath says, I will rise again. Here's the sign, the sign of Jonah. I will be in the earth three days, three nights, and come again. And if the people repented at Jonah's preaching, you ought to repent at mine. If the queen of Sheba came to God at the word of Solomon, you should come to God at mine. 
Because in the judgment, they'll be the ones that say, really? We had a lot less than you. Jesus Christ, because he is risen. He's saying it. I serve a risen Savior, right? There is no tomb to find, no bones. He's alive. Seated at the right hand of the Father until God has finished making all his enemies his footstool. And he looks at us and says, where's the repentance? He looked at the men there trying to test him. Where's the repentance? Now we can hear the words of Jesus. We can see the mighty works he's done through these pages. And then still not believe. There are men and women whose vocation is the study, explanation, and then writing down, making books about God's word who do not believe. These come without eyes of faith and they read the words, they see what God's done. And then they say, well, God used evolution to create the world. Well, Jesus was a good man, but, but all his miracles are our mythology. His rising from the dead, well, that was just a trick. In fact, some have then in unbelief said, well, Jesus was just human like you and I and even had children. You've heard of it years ago. A little book called The Da Vinci Code. Oh, Jesus was just a man. There's no way that he could walk on water. Really? You don't think God can do that? He made water. What about you? What about I? Have we seen the manifold works of God in the pages of scriptures and we still don't believe? If that's you, then on the last day of judgment, a Ninevite might walk by and go, really? You had 66 books telling you who God is. I had one really lame prophet. Will you be condemned in the last day by those who repented in faith with so much less evidence. Paul, writing about the Old Testament, tells us how good we have it. Because the Old Testament saints didn't have all that we had. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, talks about them being a great cloud of witnesses who have finished their race and are now in the stands cheering us on. And how can we turn aside when we have such a greater thing than the Old Testament because we have Jesus Christ? Hebrews puts it this way. God spoke by prophets of old, but something greater has now come. His Son, Jesus Christ. 
with you will I stand condemned. Maybe even being one of those who said, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not do great works in your name? Only to get the response, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. Yet there's hope. As we've alluded to, Paul ties the resurrection of Jesus to our hope, our confidence. We could say that because Jesus is the risen Lord, we will be raised. Even as the song says, we will be raised incorruptible. This is our hope. If Jesus didn't raise, then we are most miserable of people, but because he is raised, we know we will, and we will be like him because we will see him as he is. There is hope. In a world of prices skyrocketing, retirements evaporating, Strife and stress, a world of viruses. We have hope because Jesus is the risen Lord, as he promised. Okay, you want to sign? Jonah. Three days, three nights. Did he fulfill it? Yeah, we even have it on our calendar. Easter. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. That is our hope. For those without faith, this passage condemns, calls you to repentance. For those with faith, This is hope. A confidence. God keeps his promises. One day, there will be no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. After the great resurrection. There is hope. There is something to look forward to. All because Jesus was in the grave just as Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights.